other house I'd like to call to order the regular village council meeting of Tuesday, November 5th, 2019. If we could all stand for a moment of silence. So the record reflects those who are present. I will now call the roll. Village Attorney Serafan. I'm present. Village Manager Benton. Here. Councilman Brady. Here. Just for the record, Councilman Brady will be joining us via teleconference. Councilman Lafredo. Present. Councilman Meltz. Here. Vice Mayor Birch. Present. Mayor Wagger. Present. You have quorum. Thank you. Start, Madam Clerk, with our presentation. First up, we're going to do a proclamation um, to the Miami Country Day School students in recognition of their 20-year commitment to raising cancer awareness and funds via the Walk of Walk events. Mm -hmm. And I would like to thank the students that are here in attendance. I'm going to read their names uh, out loud for everyone to acknowledge them. Jack Lombardo, Natalia Sakoris, Nate Giovannucci, Ellie Cohen, Francesca Setnerini, Set, nope, Setnery, thank you, Hannah Amol, Amoles, Amoyles, Anika, give me, thank you, and Hannah Cohen, and Steve Port. Let's give them a hand because this is a good deal that they've done. And uh, in honor of their service, I'm going to present them this proclamation that reads as the following. Whereas the entire Miami, Day, Miami Country Day School community comes together to raise funds and awareness for their annual Walk the Walk event, and whereas the walk is organized by students who volunteer their time to help educate their community on cancer awareness, while raising money for research, and whereas the Walk for Cancer started in 1999, and to date, students have raised over $750,000 to benefit the Heidi Hughes Women's Cancer Association and the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And whereas this year, the students have reached their goal of $50,000, of which 50% will be given to Alex's Place for Pediatric Cancer Research, and 50% to the Sylvester Cancer excuse me, the Sylvester Center Cancer Research. And whereas the students, student volunteers of the walk work tirelessly to increase the quality of life for thousands of people in need, including cutting their hair to donate to Pantene Beautiful Links, who donates wigs to benefit women whose hair loss is attributed to cancer treatment. Now therefore be it resolved, I, Crystal Wagger, Mayor of Miami Shores Village, on behalf of the Village Council, do hereby proclaim heartfelt appreciation to MCDS students and volunteers of the Walk the Walk for their outstanding service for the community. Thank you, guys. <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> and I think, I think we have someone here who would like to make a little announcement that you guys might want to know about. So, uh, Yes. Uh, state oh, your I'm name for the record, please. Marilyn Greenfield. Thank you. Um, I really am their sponsor, which is the most proudest thing I think I've ever done this year. <laughs> so you're up in my support system, and I'm happy to tell you that your goal was $50,000, but you upped it to $60,000. So it's $60,000. So let's gather to take a picture with this. How, would, how do you suggest we do this, Madam Clerk? The picture. I'll do one. I'll do one with them. Just one with them. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. There you are. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good job, guys. Thank you. Six oh, six oh. Six oh, six oh. It's good work. Our next presentation is the November House of the Month Certificate in recognition, presented, uh, oh, excuse me, of recognition, presented to Betty, Matz, and family. Um, they are located at 190 Northeast 12th Avenue. The village could have easily chosen a property, and there we have, oh, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> wow. Uh, the village could have easily chosen the property based on the home's eye-catching structure, but the main attraction of the home is the landscape de design fit for a castle. The time and care to make sure the shrubbery stays this beautiful takes countless hours, labor, and creativity. Their very own in-house landscape designer, Stanley Matz, created the design and layout of the landscaping. We take great pride in calling the Matz family part of the Miami Shores Village community. And we thank you for making the village uh, beautiful. Uh, do we have anyone here? Yes, all right, come on up. Thank you. Betty Matz Gelski and Brad Gelski. Yes. And just one other thing I want to say is that when we, when my family was looking for a home almost nine years ago, we looked everywhere from South Beach to Aventura. And my children were very young then, and they were doing a lot of activities in Miami Shores. And we decided Miami Shores was for us, and we've been very happy. So thank you. That's awesome. Thank, thank you. Glad to have you. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, you want to go on the side? Can balance it all out. Come on down. Come on down. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Just beautiful. So, Mayor Weiger, if I might, Absolutely. before they go, I wanted to say that I happen to live near this home, but it also happens to be at the head of my street, so every time I drive down, I admire that landscaping. It's fantastically it's beautiful. beautiful, and it's a gift to the neighborhood. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Next up, we'll have a presentation on speed enforcement by Chief Lysad. And this uh, item is also spice. Is the chief? Where is he? Okay. Chief Lysad? Hi, I know. I know. Okay. And this is sponsored by Councilman Meltz. Mr. Meltz? Uh, Madam Mayor, may I say a few words to introduce us? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Chief Lystead for coming here today. For those folks who are at this meeting um, who haven't been to um, many of the previous meetings in the last few months, almost every meeting we've had residents concerned about speeding and traffic enforcement. You know, it's an incredible village we have. Unfortunately, a lot of folks drive through our village, and they're in a hurry. And they're not so particularly concerned with the safety of maybe even themselves, but definitely not our residents. And for those of you who live on or about 103rd or 96th or 12th or 6th or anywhere in the village, it's a major concern. And we just want to make sure that our residents know we're not sitting up here idle and, and just listening. Uh, we've worked with the village manager, with Chief Lystead, and it's not an easy fix, but the chief has been extremely responsive and if you've noticed in the last few months especially, I think he's, he's about to tell us some other things, but I, I saw traffic enforcement last Saturday and Sunday, 
I saw it the week before. And if you drive up and down our streets and you see the speed bumps and you see different things going on, we are reacting to it and we're continuing our, our commitment to make this a safer community for everybody. So without further ado, Chief, I want to thank you for coming in here today and uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Councilman Meltz and Madam Mayor. I um, appreciate you asking me to come here and give an update on traffic. And so that's what I tend to do. I will talk about um, our enforcement efforts and also talk a little bit about um, crashes in the shores, which are usually generally correlated to the same thing. So this is what we started to do at the beginning of the year. It's been an ongoing operation. We've had scheduled and directed uh, shift for traffic enforcement, basically using our same officers um, with directed activity and putting them in specific locations. We've conducted a number of wolf pack operations, which is probably what you're talking about. Um, and for those that may not know, a wolf pack operation is when we get three or four officers together, and that's all they do is focus on traffic enforcement for the entire period of time that we haven't dedicated to that. Um, we've had a number of details. Um, in, in addition to that, we use our electric sign boards to try and slow traffic down our speed trailers. Um, we also have three decoy vehicles that we've used out there, um, which as long as we move them every once in a while, um, they are effective at, slow, at slowing down traffic, particularly at stop signs and causing people to stop. And so these are some of the activities that we've had on, ongoing since January. <coughs> so what you see up there is some traffic. So what I did was I focused on some of the major thoroughfares that we had, the corridors throughout the city. And so there's about 35, depending on how, how you count it, major road segments in Miami Shores. And so, for example, if you use Northeast 2nd Avenue, a segment, one segment would be from 115th Street to 111th Street. Another segment would be from 111, uh, 111th Street to 103rd Street. Just kind of depends on the location, how we treat the segments. And so what you see there is a result of the enforcement since January 1, approximately where our officers have been uh, targeting. And so you see Northeast 2nd Avenue had 949 traffic stops. Northeast 6th Avenue had 474 traffic stops. Biscayne Boulevard, 456. 103rd Street, 425, and North Miami, 344. It's been talked about here. I know we've had some issues with 103rd Street, so I broke that one out specifically to show you in comparison to all other traffic stops. And so for all the quarters except 103rd Street, that counts for about 84% of our traffic stops since January. The traffic stops on 103rd Street, the corridor, that corridor alone from 6th Avenue to Northwest 2nd Avenue has been about 16% of our traffic stops. Now, as a caveat, due to, to, due to the stop location versus the enforcement location, some of those stops that are on 103rd Street could have been initiated from traffic violations on 2nd Avenue, and the reverse is also true. Some of the violations that occurred on 103rd, if they were speeding on 103rd and made a left or a right on 2nd Avenue, could be stopped there. So there is some overlap based on stop location and violation location. <coughs> So specifically for 103rd Street, 425 traffic stops. Out of that, 295 citations and 170 or 172 citations. The remaining of those were warnings. So this is a chart plot showing our traffic crashes from 2016 to year to date currently. So in 2016, we had 558 crashes for the year. 2017, 565. 2018, 454. And as of year to date, 2019, as of... Um, the end of October, I don't have, actually the end of September, I don't have the October numbers finalized yet. We're at 334. So I estimate we'll probably come in somewhere around 400, 410. This is a, a, basically a heat map of Miami Shore showing you the traffic crash locations. This is specifically from August 1st to November 1st. If I try to put all the crashes on there, 300 and some odd crashes, it would be very difficult to read. So I just, I just used August 1st and November 1st. And so the, the number one crash location right now is Northeast 2nd Avenue, you see with 13 crashes. Um, second is 90th Street and Biscayne Boulevard. Some of those are caused by parking lot crashes. And tied for third is 103rd Street, Northeast 2nd Avenue, and 96th Street and Biscayne Boulevard. And there you can see the representation for the remaining intersections. This is specifically 103rd Street, the crashes that happened in that same time window. And so you have four rear end crashes, which are depicted by, well, that's not going to work on these. Depicted by these markers are rear end crashes. The ones that have like a little square box, those are fixed object strikes. And the other one that has a squiggly line is an off road. And then there's two that were intersections, either left or right, turning in front and failing to yield. This heat map, it shows you where our crashes with injuries. 
And injuries can be anything from, um, and there's no fatalities in this particular graph, but injuries can be anywhere from someone saying, my neck hurts, my arm hurts, whatever. They could have been transported. And so the number one crash location right now that we're being affected by is North Miami Avenue, 103rd Street, um, followed by tied for second with 103rd Street and Northeast 2nd Avenue and 96th Street and Biscayne Boulevard. So this is depicting, this heat map is showing our uh, August to November uh, injured crashes again, 103rd and Northeast, or Northwest 2nd Avenue now has become the lead during that time window for crashes with injuries, which is tied with 96th Street and Biscayne Boulevard. <coughs> so how about citations? So our citation enforcement in 2016 when we had a traffic unit, we had motor still in play, was 3,220 citations for the year. 2017 was 2,802, 2018 was 2,546. Currently right now we sit at 3,462 citations with two months left um, for the fiscal year. We anticipate based on that number and with the pending uh, traffic crashes, however, warnings will probably go up. Um, we'll probably come in somewhere around 3,800, maybe 4,000, just depends on um, during the holidays period, some of our officers tend to have a heart and may not write citations, they may write warnings instead. So one of the other things when our officers use discretion, they also have the discretion to write a warning. Uh, the warnings now are tracked, so if we have an individual who stopped with a warning and they get a second stop and the officer sees it's a warning, they will not get a warning again. Um, we only implemented warnings in 2016, so in 2016 we had 95 warnings. In 2017, 131. 2018, we had 113. And so far, year to date, we're at 687 warnings for people that have been stopped for an infraction but weren't actually written a traffic citation. Chief, excuse me. Well, what's the criteria for warnings? Um, criteria for warning is kind of in the, in the view of the officer. So it could be uh, something that they ran their driver's license, had never received a citation for, and decided based on the infraction, say they were doing seven miles over the speed limit, they might say, hey, look, you've never had a traffic crash or never had a, a citation before, so they'll, they won't write them a, they'll write them a warning in lieu of writing a citation. Um, it could be that um, there's another issue that caused the traffic stop, whether that be um, they weren't paying attention, they didn't know, they're not from the area. Um, sometimes we stop tourists that are unfamiliar with the area, so the officers use their discretion to write a warning. It seems to be an inordinate amount of warnings in 2019 versus even though you said you started 2016 but even looking at 2018 and 2017 and i don't mean to put you on the spot but obviously i do sometimes that's okay um do you have any explanation for that even though we're not even at year end so the really only explanation is, is based on the volume of traffic stops that there is actually occurring uh traffic warnings would seem to correlate with the number of stops so the number of stops which i don't have in my slide presentation far exceeds last year's so they're going to correlate. Even like if you look at the traffic citations numbers, you see the jump between 2,800 and 3,400 currently. We could get to 4,000. So you're going to see a discrepancy there. Um, you know, there, there is some warnings being written right now that, that are in this number for um, texting and driving. It is a new law. There is a lot of education still required to make sure people, I mean, I still see people texting and driving. And so I know that there are a significant number of warnings being written for, um, at least I've been told there's significant warnings being dealt with written for just for texting and driving. So with the new laws, right. there'll be some time for that to um, permeate the driving populace. So 2019-2020, um, these are some of our targets. So everything that you saw and you saw accomplished um, was with the benefit that we had three individuals and in field training officers, a vacancy, and an officer that was out on maternity leave. Um, we expect all those resources to be full strength um, and back in play by the end of the year. <coughs> So that will add, should add at least four additional people to staffing for traffic enforcement. Um, our traffic unit deployment, as you know, in the budget, you had the, uh, the requisition to pro provide the traffic unit. We will start the traffic unit before that time, timeline happens, but um, uh, as soon as we can, we'll order the units for that particular activity. We'll continue with our ongoing enforcement actions um, with the directed patrols and the wolf packs. And we'll continue to use the data that's driven uh, our resources so far. So we base that on... Um, citizen complaints, our smart trailer numbers that show us where the speeding problem is, um, surveys, and actually where the officers are actually finding enforcement action necessary. Um, and we'll continue to do that until we can drive the crash numbers down and uh, basically stop 
the complaints over traffic enforcement or traffic speeding and, and the complaints in the neighborhoods. And with that, happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Chief, the speed trailers, when did you acquire them? How many do you have and do you consider them effective? So, I want to say that we have two speed trailers and we actually have another device um, which is a pole mount. It's not really a trailer. It's really only effective on um, single each directional way roadway. And so we use that in locations where um, a resident may complain about speed and our traffic trailer doesn't necessarily show us the problem um, because a lot of times when people see the traffic trailer they'll actually slow down and so we get a false we get a false sense that there's not a traffic issue there. When we see that on those roadways we'll put that device out there. So we have um, two smart trailers and a third device. Um, the name of what that device is is escaping me right now. And so it, it is effective to a certain degree as long as it's programmed right. Um, and what is really useful for us for is, is when it's effective and the data is effective, it drives our responses so we can see exact time frames. Um, a lot of times we see anomalies. We'll see someone that's, that's um, testing the performance of their car, for lack of a better term. Um, but we have a program that, that if they go exceeding speed, it'll just shut off so they really don't know what the number is. But um, as far as age, um, I want to say the, 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 the last trailers were brought somewhere in the 2010-11 time range is my best guess, but I could be wrong on that. I'd have to pull, I'd have to pull my capital and look. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Mayor. Do you think, um, Chief, that this program of enhanced enforcement is having an impact on the speeders on 103rd Street? I do think it's having an impact. I don't think it's where we would, uh, or the residents, and we would like it to be, um, but we'll continue until we get to where we're comfortable and feel like we've, we've addressed the, the problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Mayor. <laughs> Chief, we, we often hear folks ask us, why can't we be like Biscayne Park used to be? Well, the good parts of Biscayne Park where um, speeding was not tolerated. Don't even think of speeding through Miami Shores. Can that ever be a reality? Why can't we, or what would you need to do that so folks are frightened to speed through here where we can guarantee safety? Um, is, is it something maybe have you considered more of a presence at our borders? Or, or like, like how do we get to that point? Because I'll, I'll tell you candidly, I never sped through Biscayne Park. And I'm sure a lot of bunch of people here did the same thing. You were careful. People aren't careful here, Chief. So what can we do? So a couple things. And I don't, I don't think you meant to use the word frightened. Um, I think what you meant to say was is that we have compliance to the law, because that's what we strive for. I said frightened. said frightened. <laughs> um, and so there's a, there's a drastic distance when you look at that for resource allocation and, and service delivery. Uh, Biscayne Park has one major thoroughfare. That's Northeast 6th Avenue. That's the only roadway. Uh, we have a, a, quite a few number of segments through here. Um, and I know it's not realistic for me to suggest, um, although I have in past times when we brought back the traffic units, I've suggested toll booths um, because no one will come through here if there's a toll booth unless they have business here and it will slow traffic down. But I don't think you're going to get that accomplished. Um, so really, to, to get to where you, you would like to be or if you would like to, to have that approach would really require probably about six people, maybe eight people assigned specifically just to traffic enforcement, and that's all they do. What, what's your plan for how many folks are going to be assigned year in once you're back up to the full capacity? So right now our plan is probably somewhere in the range of two full-time and a third alternate, potentially a full third time, depending on um, – it's about balancing that versus our Class 1 crimes, our, our burglaries, our robberies, our thefts. And so well, we have to keep an eye to that too. I mean, that, that's – and I want to put this in context for everybody because – you know, I mean, it wasn't so long ago we had residents really upset about burglaries, a home invasion, and other violent or person crimes. And your department did a great job. We don't hear that anymore. So we just have to be careful, right, where we put our resources because you, you know. It, it's about prioritization. And, you know, we have done a, a phenomenal job, and I'm, I'm going to try very hard not to jinx myself. Um, you know, as far as residential break-ins, um, last month and this month, we made history here. Last month, we had, 
we had zero residential break-ins. Wow. This, uh, the month ending uh, November 1st, October, so September and October, we had zero residential break-ins. That is unheard of. Our historical average was usually somewhere around 4 to 12, and we have been beating that number down. And so um, there is somewhat of a correlation between traffic enforcement and burglaries, but that is not the sole correlation. So really what it comes down to is trying to manage the resources we have versus the complaints and issues we have and try and make sure that there's a, a good fit for that. And when I hear um, continual from the council and my boss about traffic, we will ship more resources of traffic until one of two things happens. We've arrested that problem and it stops, or a more serious crime or issue spurs up in the community and I have to redirect resources to, do, to prevent that from happening. Thank you, Chief, for your presentation. It's excellent. One more question, and, Chief. I'm sorry. No, One hold more. on. I want, let me finish oh, my thought oh, real quick. No, no, no. I want to finish my thought. Oh. Um, Congratulations on the zero burglary counts or break-ins, and you've explained to me the difference in all that, and I appreciate it. And the fact that you have put all these things in place to combat the speeding issues that we have here, I appreciate. And so if it's any indication of what you did with the break-ins with regard to speeding, I think we're on a good path. So I just wanted to say thank you, and um, we'll continue to monitor this because it is of great importance to our community. So I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Councilman, or Vice Mayor Birch. Yes, I just, to change, not to change the subject too drastically, but I do want to congratulate you and the entire department on the Police Explorers program. And I have, I'm just so thrilled to see it happening and burgeoning in popularity amongst the, the young students. And they are going to learn so much from this program through the well-organized department that we have that has seen the, the, the possibilities of the program. And I remember in 2015 when, the, when uh, Jack Rodriguez, the young man who was really anxious to get the program started, um, came to me and talked about it. Um, from that point to what it is today is really remarkable. And I want to thank you for making room in, the, in, the, in all of this busy schedule of the police department for that program to target our youth because it's working and it's wonderful. I appreciate that, Vice Mayor. It's a great program. Our guys love it. Um, you know, I, I have to somewhat admit that I have an ulterior motive. Um, it's a recruiting ground. I hope to hire some of them. So I hope to bring them into the fold and we'll recruit some of them and hopefully, you know, once they get through college, they'll come back to us as officers and, and serve the community they grew up in. Councilman Meltz? Uh, Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I apologize for interrupting. I thought you were sending them off, and I just wanted to get myself in there. So um, on, on that topic, I do also want to commend you on your, some of your new hires. I've, I've noticed that a lot of the new officers are extremely engaging, friendly, and they're great representatives and ambassadors for, for the village, and I, I think in, uh, it has to be your command staff and yourself who's, who's putting those sort of uh, virtues and instilling those values in them, especially it was noticeable at Green Day and, and throughout – and when we have them at the schools now, I have some of the, the kids at the schools are big fan favorites of whoever's been at, at St. Rose. And so I, I really appreciate what you're doing in that regard. And, uh, and again, thank you for coming here and listening to these questions. And as you always stand up well and represent our community, we appreciate you listening to the residents. And I know those, some of the folks who are most concerned about speeding aren't here tonight. Go figure. Uh, but I'm, I'm always, always convinced that your door and, and your phone is always available for our residents if they do have concerns to reach out. Am I correct? That's the best way. Please don't email me. I'm at 1,300 emails. Please don't email me. <laughs> Call me. It would be great. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could just add one more comment, just to remind everybody, it is holiday season coming up. We tend to get busy. So for those of you out shopping, particularly the malls, if we don't have any. Um, try not to go mall to mall with your property in a car because criminals will follow you. Um, you'll be somebody else's victim, but I would rather not have our, our residents become victims. So remember the holidays are on us and uh, the criminals are out there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on now to public comment. Uh, for those of you here wishing to make public comment, please state your name and address for the record and kindly keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, we are now open for public comment. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Robert Menji. I live at 1102 Northeast 105th Street. And I'm just here to be thankful that 
one of your councilmen has brought to the attention the problems that have recently occurred at party houses involving vacation rentals. And I would appreciate your support tonight regarding the uh, parking restrictions. It gives help to the community to police and enforce, and it also gives a chance for gathering information. We all know what happened over in California. Five people were dead at a party house Halloween. The police still haven't been able to identify anybody. And that's one of the most important things. You know, if people are going to be staying in our neighborhood, they're going to come in here. They should have to have some type of registry, which is required in the state statutes, to be able to police and enforce it. And it's not, you know, just only on the police, but also the citizens. They need to be able to speak up and say they're having problems because a lot of these people are not telling the truth when they rent. It's already been proven because um, the gentleman who's in charge of vacation rentals has admitted these people come in, they bring someone else in, and all of a sudden there's a party of 100 people. The police officers in California were overwhelmed. There were over 100 people there, and they were there at the time of the shooting. We couldn't track down who it was. It was impossible. We have more resources here because we have other law enforcement agencies in close perimeter, but that would mean shutting down a neighborhood, and that really is dangerous also. You know, innocent people could be affected by the situation. That's why I really appreciate all your support and going forward with, you know, the restricted parking and paying more attention to the vacation rentals. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Good evening. Susan Ackley, 1119 Northeast 99th Street. Um, I am requesting council's approval of the Sculpture Parks extension for another two years. It was only approved for one year. We did provide some information for you which showed that we had um, expended $5,500 creating the park. And um, to us, to the, to the board, it represents more than one half of the budget that we received from the village. Now, it was not all village funds, but I try to put it in perspective because in order to have what I consider to be a signature um, foot location for our village, um, I don't know, I don't know what, to, uh, I was prepared, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> Um, it's just very important for our village. I know of one realtor when he's showing homes who actually drives by it to show what our community has. Um, I have had reports, although I haven't seen it myself, that we have families that picnic there. And so its intent was a passive park, and I believe it is. So I would really appreciate your support extending it for another two years. It will not cost anything. And the artist who has loaned us the works has approved the two-year extension. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Good evening. I'm Mary Lou McGuire at 10627 Northeast 10th Court. I just wanted to add a few comments on the party houses. As you know, in South Miami, approximately two weeks ago, an, another young man was killed. Uh, he received, he was allowed to go to the party as a reward from his parents for doing so good in school. Uh, so it's, it's actually hitting home in Miami now. And also, the morning of uh, the noise at 7 o'clock and the party people. Many of us go to 7 o'clock mass at St. Rose. There's at least one house on every side of the street. And we were coming back and going in, and we had these party people coming up Northeast 10th Place, just walking. My immediate reaction when I turned in was, thank God my three grandchildren weren't with me attending 7 o'clock mass because they may have asked me, what are all these party people doing here with very little clothes on? And I would have had to explain that. 
because most of us that go to 7 o'clock Mass, we have brought our children, our grandchildren, etc. So I, my second reaction was, which party house are they coming from? But the first thing was, thank God the kids weren't in the car with me. So I just want, we have, we need everybody. We need the council, the code enforcement, the police. We need anything you can think of to help us control these party houses. Because it's just a matter of time before one of us gets hurt or killed. Something goes wrong in one of these houses, there's only one way in and out of our section, we're stuck. We're, we're, we are just basically waiting to get hurt. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to note that that, is, that, that item is a public hearing, so you will have an opportunity mm -hmm. to speak to it. But anyone else uh, here to make public comment? Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not you. Um, my name is Philippe Alouard, and I live uh, 1050 Northeast 105th Street, so I'm a neighbor of uh, Roberts. And uh, right now there is a lot of uh, discussion on, um, on the... Uh, uh, on the web, you know, in uh, on next door Miami and among people, you know, regarding the uh, the matter of the uh, short-term rentals, um, and uh, being a neighbor of uh, of a house where we've had uh, uh, repeated uh, problems, I'm of, co of course, you know, very sensitive to the uh, to the to the problem. Uh, however. Um, I think you know we shouldn't. Uh, we should be very careful uh, not to throw the baby with the uh, with uh, with the water of the bath. Um, you know, we. I, I believe that we want to to keep uh, short-term rentals because uh, when we have uh, people from our family visiting, you know, we want to have the ability to to have them uh, nearby. Uh, we also want eventually, you know, uh, to to have the possibility uh, within the law, you know, to to rent our house short term up to 28 days a year, you know, to supplement uh, our income, you know, when we are retired, you know, uh, to pay taxes which are increasing, insurance premiums which are increasing. So, you know, we don't want to to lose that uh, uh, that possibility. Now, at the same time, you know, I think what, that's what we want to, uh, we all want to, to avoid are the big parties, you know, with uh, uh, trash all around the place and, uh, and uh, vehicles being parked uh, anywhere. So I think, you know, we should look at uh, regulation uh, and, and uh, enforcement. Unfortunately, it seems, you know, that we cannot hold the tenants uh, directly responsible, but that the owners. Are, are the ones who are getting fined uh, ultimately, you know. If uh, so, uh, I just wanted to uh, to voice my concern about uh, the possibility, uh, you know, my desire to maintain the possibility of having uh, short-term rentals, but in a controlled environment and only for a residential purpose. There is a second uh, matter that I would like to uh, to point out. There is uh, a proposal to uh, um, to start uh, a system of parking with uh, parking permits. You know, in uh, in our street, uh, I think it's a very good idea. But I don't think it should be limited to our street because you know we are. Uh, it's true that right now we have several uh, short-term rentals on 105th Street, but if we if we implement that rule only in uh, 105th Street, you know, uh, people are going to, to, to park in uh, 10th Avenue, 10th Place, 11th Court, and, and so on. So, you know, I think if, if we want to implement that, we should look at, uh, at implementing it for the whole uh, Miami Shore Estate or, you know, other streets in the, in the city. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Anyone else here wishing to make public comment? Okay, thank you all. Um, with that, public comment is now closed. Item 6C, approval of the October 15, 2019 Village Council meeting minutes. Uh, Vice Mayor Birch? I'll move the minutes. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. <laughs> thank you, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Madam Clerk. Item 7A, appointments to the Code Enforcement Board. There are two vacancies for three-year terms. 
The village clerk's office received six applications from Siku Caldwell, Cladis Coya, Angel Diaz, Christina Helms, Alejandro Menendez, and Robert Vickers. All of the applicants meet the residency requirement. And for those applicants who are present, you'll have an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself. In the interest of time, please limit your comments to three minutes. First applicant, Siku Caldwell. Hello, everyone. My name is Seku Caldwell. I live, no problem at all. I'm at 142 Northwest 101st Street. Um, this is my first board meeting, and I have to say listening to everyone talk tonight has really reinforced my desire to be on the Code Enforcement Board. Um, indeed, most of my professional career has sort of led to this um, being on this board. Um, I went to law school in University of Washington in Seattle and started my career as a real estate attorney. I did that for a number of years until a real estate crash. <laughs> um, and then went to work for the National Park Service doing land acquisition for the National Parks. Um, I then went back to private practice and then moved to Miami Shores in 2017 when I purchased my first home. Um, I was looking for a way to be able to serve my community, to be able to help out in a way that uses my professional skills. And I think the Code Enforcement Board is an exact perfect match. Um, I find myself, to be fair, I hope other people would agree, uh, to be just. I work well on a team together. Um, and I think this would be a great way to serve the community and also use my professional skills in a positive way. So, once again, my name is Sekou Caldwell. I appreciate the time. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Gladys Koya. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gladys Koya. I live at 1400 Northeast 101 Street. I have been a Miami Shores resident since 1994. Actually, used to live behind Mr. Serafin. Uh, I am a lawyer. I practice civil litigation, and I have been um, serving on the Code Enforcement Board for the past three years, and I am here hoping to seek reappointment to that board. Um, I think our board at present is, is uh, very fair and balanced. We, strike, um, we strive to um, strike a balance between the needs of, of the residents and the code enforcement and our regulations in a fashion that um, kind of hopefully makes everyone happy. So um, I just would love to continue to serve. I love to give back to my community. I am a past president of Miami Shores Chamber. So I like to think of myself as a, an involved member of my community, and I hope to continue to serve in that capacity. Thank you. Angel Diaz. Christina Helms. Good evening, Council. Uh, 142 Northwest 101st Street. Uh, I am also an attorney. Uh, apparently, we are all drawn to this uh, board vacancy. <laughs> um, so with that, um, I will keep it short and sweet. I have been a resident of Miami Shores for two years, and I hope to stay a resident for a very, very long time. Um, when I saw the vacancy on the Nextdoor app, I thought that this would be a good way for me to help ensure that the village stays beautiful and the wonderful place that it is. So thank you all for your time this evening. Alejandro Menendez. Um, Alejandro Menendez, I live at 10520 uh, Northeast 6th Avenue. I am not an attorney. I'm a contractor. Uh, I do high-end homes in the Ball Harbor, Bay Harbor area, and I've moved in two and a half years ago, and I just saw the board meeting, and I wanted to see if I can uh, join and help out with uh, keeping our city, our village, you know, beautiful. Thank you. And Robert Vickers. Okay, Council, your ballots are located in the upper right-hand corner.
Councilman Brady, will you be casting a voice vote? Yes. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, for uh, I, I was ready for Gladys Koya and Robert Pickers. Thank you. Thank you. Gladys Koya and Robert Vickers have received majority vote. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Madam Mayor? Thanks, can I just, Madam Vice Mayor. Can I just say thank you to everyone for applying? And the other thing I'd like to say is that those of you who, who might have lived here um, a relatively short time, please think about applying again. There has been an unusual amount yes. of, of activity in the desire to serve on boards, and we find, and we know when you apply, if you have applied before. And so that's why I, I want to just encourage you to apply again. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Meltz. Yeah, and I don't want to sound preachy, but what I said last time we had a, um, two meetings ago, we had a lot of um, vacancies to fill. What what is important to me too is the the commitment you know the meetings are open you can go to meetings and if you come back next time said you know what i i've attended six of the last seven meetings it shows a commitment which may outweigh a shorter time that you've lived here i mean it, i didn't know before that you could go to meetings and you could sort of see how things work you could have the experience of being on the board without being on the board and that speaks volumes for somebody like mm -hmm. me up here when I see your application. You didn't just you know, see it on the Internet and just come in and say, I can do it. You've been to the <coughs> meetings. So that's free advice, but it would mean, some, mean something to me next time if I was considering your application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. you for taking the time. It's pretty preachy. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk? Item 7B, appointment to the General Employee Pension Board. There is one employee representative vacancy, and incumbent Jim McCoy has reapplied. The clerk's office opened the application process for a period of one month and posted ads in the communal areas of Village Hall, Recreation Department, and Public Works, and we only received uh, the incumbent Jim McCoy. Your ballots are located in the upper right-hand corner because it's not inferred that you have one applicant, that you have to select that applicant. Also, in considering that there's only one applicant, you can also vote by acclamation or appoint by acclamation. Madam Mayor. I'm Mr. Alfredo. Uh, since the clerk has brought that up, I want to say that in a past life, I served for a number of years with Board Member McCoy, and it's probably because he has the confidence of his fellow employees that nobody else applied, so I'd move a, to appoint him by acclamation. That's okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. Next item is 8A. Discussion and possible action to establish a residential parking zone on Northeast 105th Street from Northeast 10th Court to Northeast 11th Court. This item is sponsored by Councilman Stephen Lafredo. And Madam Mayor, this is a public hearing. Yes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Council, since this is a public hearing, I'm going to open it to the floor again for comments. Uh, so if anyone is here who has comments on item 8A, please step to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Madam Mayor. Yes. Can I read my memorandum into Absolutely. the record first? Absolutely. Go ahead, Mr. Lafredo. Yeah, I just for the record, I'd like to read my memo Absolutely. into the record. And it's directed to Mr. Benton, village manager, and it says, this memorandum is to serve as my request to place an item on the council's agenda for the November 5th meeting. Name of the item would be discussion and possible action to establish a residential parking zone on Northeast 105th Street from Northeast 10th Court to Northeast 11th Court. The reason for this request is I have become aware of continuing problems with what I term party houses on Northeast 105th Street bordering the Biscayne Canal. 
There was a slack period for them over the summer, but the rentals have recently picked up, and we are now going into the winter season. It is not unreasonable to expect that the activity of these houses will continue to increase. I fully understand that as purported Airbnbs, we, not, we cannot prevent these party houses from operating. How there, however, there have been serious complaints about their patrons coming there in multiple vehicles, clogging the streets, and blocking other people from access to their property. Also, since the area is low-lying and they have beautiful grassy swale areas, it would not take many weeks of heavy parking traffic to seriously damage the swale areas and the area's attractiveness. Since these are no doubt profit-generating enterprises, I see no reason why they cannot transport their customers into the area via minibus or perhaps require them to take Uber or Lyft. And that way their presence would be less disruptive and the residents will have their driveways, streets, and swale areas returned to them. Therefore, I am seeking to have the Council Act to designate this area as a residential parking zone. While the park party houses would still be able to park two or three vehicles in the driveway of their rented homes, their customers would have to make other arrangements. And I believe that a petition for this is circulating. Now, please understand that Airbnbs are legal through the state of Florida, and this is not against Airbnbs. And some of these party houses sometimes are just Airbnbs. But I, the, the, and this is based upon some emails we got from people across the hall that I read, across the canal that I read in the summer. This is the basis, not from the people on 105th Street, but people that were across the canal complaining to us and also from photographs taken of some rentals back in September where the streets were clogged with cars. So this will measure, if approved by the council, will allow us to at least regulate the clogging of the streets and keep, it, keep the party activities inside the houses, which is where they belong. Thank you, Councilman Lafredo. Anyone want to make public comment on this item? Mr. Menji. Again, Robert Menji, 1102 Northeast 105 Street. I believe this is a step in the right direction. And there are other people here, also people who rent these houses, and they are having difficulty with their patrons, actually trying to enforce what they have signed in the contract. And I'm hoping that some of them would be able to speak and discuss the issues they're having. They need our support. They need the support of code enforcement, and they need the support of the police department. When these irate and upset individuals realize you can't have a party, they really get upset. And they attempt to take it out on the person who rented to them, even though a lot of times those are not the people who originally rented the house. They lie on the contract. And that's what I'm hoping that we all are able, there are some people here who are shy, they're here, they're going to speak up. And they're concerned that it will spread to other locations, which may happen. But at least we're on the forefront, we're on the right track. And a parking situation that we have now is out of control. If we can start in this direction, I think it's a positive effort for all of us and our neighborhood. And many of these people are going to want it in their neighborhood as well. I'm just bringing that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Birch. Hi, uh, I'm Janet Goodman. I live at 1174 Northeast 105 Street. I'm on the canal side. And I agree with Robert Menji that this is a step in the right direction. But I am absolutely furious right now um, about the whole vacation rental situation on our block, our little block. Seems like one by one by one, houses are turning into Airbnbs. And I know I'm not allowed to ask any questions, but I hope that there's some limit to the number of Airbnbs it can be. And I see someone shaking their head. <laughs> there is no limit. Um, yeah, I, I'm ju I just one on the record saying that I'm very unhappy with the situation with the Airbnbs in our neighborhood. I'm not familiar with other neighborhoods in Miami Shores that have so many of them. And I would think that the village would be concerned because these are really commercial enterprises. Um, they're turning into commercial enterprises that this is a residential neighborhood that I live in. It's not supposed to be a commercial neighborhood. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to make public comment on this? 
Matter? Sure. Uh, Mary Lou again. When the petition was circulating, the people that own, I think almost all five of them, contacted us and asked if they could sign because they needed help in reinfor enforcing. They needed help because they were told these are re uh, family reunions. They're not. They weren't. The, the, um, and they actually contacted us and asked us if they could sign the petition also. That means a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Birch. Yes, so um, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank Councilman Lafredo because I believe this is a brilliant idea that didn't occur to those of us who were serving earlier when the residential parking permit idea came up and we um, hashed it out uh, for so long because it was in my brain that this was something that we were doing for downtown. And so by extension, you have had a really good idea for something that I think is going to be successful. Um, the residential parking permit idea has been successful in the streets that lie next to Second Avenue when when the residents wanted it. And um, we, we've been very pleased, those residents have been very pleased with the results and I think this, this will work on this street that has what I would call very sensitive swales. Um, it's, it's a street that floods easily yes. and that when, ti when a tire goes through that area um, to attempt to use it as a parking space, it may actually be driving over the stormwater drains. And this, um, this is just the last thing you need. So I, I'm very grateful to you, Councilman Lafredo, for coming up with this idea, and to you, Mr. Menji, for circulating the petition. I understand you were the chief circulator, and I want to thank you for that. And should there be other streets that encounter this, we are certainly willing to um, entertain that motion in the future. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes. If I may, just <clears throat> I wanted to say just for one minute, and a lot of the people in this room already know this, but some may not. Um, don't assume that this council is not concerned or interested in doing something about um, vacation rentals or Airbnbs. Uh, the Florida legislature has preempted the field and basically put severe limitations on what any city can do um, in terms of restricting this. So we're trying very hard to work within those limitations and serve the interests of our residents, but it's really the Florida legislature that has um, in my personal view, exacerbated this problem by taking uh, control out of the hands of the local authorities and putting it all up in the hands of the legislature that gets heavily lobbied by the um, vacation rental industry. So it, it's, it's not a lack of desire on the part of your local elected officials. Their hands are tied uh, in great part by the Florida legislature. Thank you, Mr. Serafin. And that kind of goes to my question. I just want to be clear that because it's, it's a state legislative matter, um, that in enacting this, we're not going to run afoul oh, no. of anything with the state. No, this is. I wouldn't let this come to you if I had any legal Very concerns good. about it. Very good. Thank you. Any other comments? Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Manager. If I may, to address some of Mr. Menji's comments, our code enforcement people are there now literally seven days a week. On, their di on, our, on his day off, our code director actually comes into your neighborhood Every day, okay, so when if you have a problem, we see it, we've issued citations, we've had hearings before the Code Enforcement Board, fines have been assessed. If at any time you feel threatened, that's what our police department's for. If there's an issue with, uh, you know, as a, as a property owner, if somebody is intimidating you or you feel threatened, call the police. Our police will respond. If there's a problem there, they will take care of it. They're, we're here to help you. And we spend a lot of time in your community. We're there every single day checking in and, and making sure that things go smoothly. If they don't, we take whatever measures we have in our tool bag to rectify the problem. And this parking decal situation will be another tool that we can use if something gets out of hand and there's a lot of parking there. We'll be, uh, if it passes, we'll be able to issue tickets to those violators. Thank you, Mr. Manager. 
Um, I see here that we've got 28 signatures, and it does seem like this would provide some sort of relief for this community. So having said that, do we have any other comments from the council? Sir, would you like to make a comment? Uh, my name is Howard Albert. I live on uh, Northeast 11th Avenue, just off of 105th. Uh, I have called the police a couple of times on this, and I get, well, we can't do anything about the parking and so forth. Um, but I think we do need to have maybe something on the other streets as well, because... They are going to just go around the corners, and uh, there's the same problem with the flooding and the swales. It's going to be the same issue. But I, I didn't, I, you know, we weren't shown that petition, so I'd like to sign it. Um, again, all the houses, I'm sure, in the whole neighborhood would probably sign it. I think if you work with staff, they can probably get you uh, on the right track towards circulating. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Birch. I'd like to go ahead and move the item. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Item 9A, an ordinance of the Village Council of Miami Shores Village, Florida, relating to zoning, Appendix A, amending Article 5, Division 4, Area Regulations, Section 516, Structures constituting accessory buildings, providing for conflicts, codification, stability, and effective date. Staff on this item is the Planning and Zoning Director. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, Travis Kendall, Planning and Zoning. So uh, this item, I'm just going to take a couple minutes and talk about it, a little bit of background to get everybody uh, caught up on the same page. Uh, right now, uh, the code is a little uh, conflicting in that um, there are some... It's not clear for residents who come in uh, as to the location of mechanical equipment which can be placed in the side yard. We currently have a regulation that says if you have a pre-existing air conditioning unit, for example, and it's replaced, you can put it back in the same location, which is fine, and that will continue to, to go forward. However, um, it, it doesn't actually specifically say that new mechanical equipment is prohibited in the side yard setback. And when I'm referring to this ordinance and the ordinance change, uh, we're only talking about 10 feet on the sides and 5 feet in the rear, and this goes for any type of mechanical equipment. Um, some of the challenges that I've, I've been um, coming across over the, the course of my time here is residents will come in specifically on pool equipment or new pool equipment, and they'll want to put it in, in the 10-foot required setback. And the, the intent of the code has changed to say that mechanical equipment, specifically air conditioning, uh, is prohibited in the side yard. However, it does not go further far enough to identify all mechanical equipment. And the, the change that's, that's in front of use is to uh, clarify that to specifically say no mechanical equipment, no new mechanical equipment is permitted to be in the 10 yard required side yard setback. Um, if there was anything pre existing and they want to replace it, they can certainly replace it in the same place. And what I'm referring to is pool pumps, uh, irrigation pumps, generators, and air conditioning units, and any other mechanical equipment that I'm, I'm familiar with that may or may not be placed in the side yard, because maybe there's something that I am not off the top of my head can remember. So really, that's, that's really what you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple little bookkeeping things that I'd like to correct. Uh, the first one is in the staff report, um, there was, uh, it should read, uh, under the subject, it should say uh, public hearing under the Planning Zoning Code have provided a recommendation to council. It says provide. I just want to get that corrected. And then um, <clears throat> for the, the verbiage itself uh, in the ordinance, uh, I'd like to uh, propose some changes between first and second reading um, that would specifically clarify it. Uh, there was an issue with some confusion about ground-mounted air conditioning units, which was mentioned. And on your line 29, I'd like to have that removed between first and second reading so that the specific ordinance would read, uh, starting at line 28, air conditioning units and mechanical equipment, including pool pumps, uh, in the R and Pro districts shall be set back a minimum of 10 feet from the side plot line, 5 feet from the rear plot line, and shall not be located in the first 25 feet of the property. Further, it should read, the Planning and Zoning Board shall approve any design located uh, in the first 20, farther than the first 25 feet of the property. <clears throat> then on line 34, uh, it will read, starting at line 32, air, air conditioning units and mechanical equipment, including pool pumps, are not permitted 
uh, in the first 25 feet uh, within any land use district. So those are the specific changes. That's a little bit of the background as to why uh, I'm asking for the clarification in the code. Uh, right now, I, I have some situations where uh, residents come in and they say, show me specifically where it says uh, that I can't put a pool pump in the side yard. And I, I have to refer to uh, what's considered a, a permanent structure. So I say, well, it, it doesn't address pool pumps specifically. However, the intent of the code is not to permit it there. Uh, however, the slab that you're going to place it on technically uh, is considered uh, something in the, that, that is yeah, structure uh, and prohibited by code. So I'm, I'm referring back to that. This would clarify that issue that I'm having uh, and would be of great assistance, I think, to the, to the residents in, in clarifying. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mayor Bridge, do you have a motion? Uh, you have a question? I, I have a question. Okay. Well, Mr. Kendall, in making those corrections, you've, um, you've eased my mind. I felt that, um, but I feel that there's one more thing, um, and that is that you, if we're saying including pool pumps, we might as well say including generators. That's the next big loud thing that we could be putting in a yard. Right. Well, it, it actually says mechanical equipment, and I was just using IE pool pump as an example, but it, it actually would apply to any mechanical equipment, and a generator would be mechanical equipment as well. So, um, <clears throat> I see the generator is the elephant in the room amongst this, <laughs> this mechanical equipment. Yes, that's correct. It, that's, yes, Can I say something? Mr. Lafreda. I second what Vice Mayor Birch said. I think it should be spelled out. The... <laughs> If I may through the mayor. The, the challenge that I have with that is, is to try and, if, if it doesn't say, we can certainly add uh, generators in this the verbiage, but I believe that mechanical equipment should remain because, again, there may be some type of mechanical equipment that I'm unaware of that that I just haven't thought of. Something tomorrow. Yeah. Right. I, I just think Vice Mayor Birch wanted you to put the word generator in clearly. Certainly. That's no problem at all. We can add that between first and second. Okay. Um, and my other question is the first 25 feet of property that's you just brought that out tonight so I was wondering if that meant that if you were in a a home that your generator is subject to saltwater intrusion in the backyard then if it was in with within the first 25 beyond the first 25 feet of the lot they would be able to locate it in some sort of um, screen uh, enclosure screen that is enclosure correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Just to clarify, uh, the lawyer in me insists, when you say the first 25 feet, you mean within 25 feet of the front plot the line. Street. That's correct, yes. Right. Front plot line. line. Should front. probably be in the front. language. Front line. Front line. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Meltz. Yes, Madam Mayor. Mr. Kendall, you know how to clear a room pretty well. I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, mechanical equipment, um, and I understand the reason for this, for loud, obtrusive things to your neighbors, but, but had you considered tankless water heaters? Now, we're trying to get to something more environmentally friendly, and if you're going to now mandate that residents put those on the back away from, um, you know, where regular plumbing would be <coughs> and where the box would be and things like that so. tell me how that worked into your, well, uh, your actually, evaluation most tankless water heaters are actually placed inside the house i say that mm -hmm. I, I have one in my home it's mm -hmm. actually uh, in the house itself uh, because of the electrical equipment and the the electronics uh, generally that are inside of it i think it's um, a building code or electrical code requirement well for a propane one well again same thing it's the same as mechanical same? equipment yes oh. that, that's correct so they would have to be farther than 10 feet away from the property line, which generally the fire department would require for, for, for safety reasons. So wait a minute, so back up. So you would say you would have to put the tankless heater inside the house. You can no longer put them on the outside of the house. Well, you could as long as they were farther than 10 feet from the property line. But generally the, the but tankless water heaters are only about four inches. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that, that, you know, again, that would be an issue uh, if it's attached to the house. So specifically, I, I mean, it's it's low profile to begin with, but again, most of those um, are going to be on the inside. But specifically to answer the question, if it was less than 10 feet, it would be prohibited. It's mechanical equipment. That's right. Correct. So, but all we're talking just about, I don't know, the majority of the homes, you don't have the 10 feet on the side, right? 
Um, the, well, again, the majority of homes do have 10 feet. There are some that do not, based upon how they were constructed in the past, um, which is the homes that are of issue. So I, I can't speculate as to, you know. Go back to what you said. You said four inches. You mean so it protrudes off the house only four inches, so you think that would make them okay? Well, you can specify um, tankless water heaters to be excluded from the requirement if you'd like. But again, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it, why a tankless water heater and not a water a pool pump? I mean, <laughs> so so if I might before um, so I feel like we're going down this rabbit hole of what what is included in by definition of mechanical equipment. Right. right? Well, that's that's uh, the problem. That's, that's what we're point. trying to figure yeah. out. Attorney Serafin. All right. Um, if I may, it, sound is not the only issue, and this was fleshed out quite a bit at uh, PNZ. There's a lot of reasons. For the, for example, the side setback. One of the ideas is, look, God forbid, there's a fire. You need the responders to be able to get in between the houses, unobstructed, with equipment. There's uh, security issues. When police drive down the street, uh, we like to have a little corridor that they could see, you know, off times. Um, not to have places where um, bad guys can hide. There's all sorts of reasons for having a clear. Uh, side setback. And again, it's just the first 10 feet uh, off the property line. That's a side setback. Now, you're right. Some of these houses are built right up to the side setback, but you can't, you can't legislate based on that. Um, we have to legislate based on the ideal of what we want. And, um, you know, all of these, uh, sound is certainly a reason for it. Uh, and aesthetics and all of these other concerns all play a role in it. Um, you know, I'm, I wasn't sure about the tankless water heater example, but I can think of things that are silent that you still wouldn't want to have in that 10-foot setback for a lot of these same reasons. And there are other places you can put them, inside and outside. And uh, again, even in, if you have a big enough front yard with appropriate screening, you could put stuff there, put certain things you could put on the roof, certain things go in the house, certain things go in the backyard. You know, there, there are options. And in, if you have a house that is so constructed that there is no option, then there's a variance available. You know, if there really is no other option. If you've got a house that's built up to all the setbacks and you've got nowhere you can put it, you know, that's a unique uh, condition. Any other comments? Um, Vice Mayor Birch. Well, what about the suggestion that we just call, we just say mechanical equipment and we don't specify? And we say nothing about air conditioners or tankless water heaters or generators, then if it's a, mechan a piece of a mechanical equipment and staff so designates, then um, it, it has to fall within the rule. Perfectly legitimate. I think staff would appreciate at least mentioning the pool equipment because I think that's the one that causes the most questions at the I, desk. I, I think for clarification, the 99% the, the uh, which are the, the pool equipment, air conditioning units, and generators, should be uh, called out by name specifically. That's the primary issue. Okay. And we'll make changes by the so. next hearing, and, and you'll have a cleaner version. All right. Mr. Lafredo? Yes, I'll move approval on first reading. I have a second. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Very good. Thank you. Councilman Brady? Aye. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Item 9B, an ordinance of the Village Council of Miami Shores Village, Florida, adopting the 2020 Capital Improvements Project Schedule Annual Update to the Miami Shores Village 2025 Comprehensive Plan and providing for an effective date. This item is uh, brought forward by the Planning and Zoning Director. Travis. Yes, hi, good evening. Again, uh, Travis Kemmel, Planning and Zoning. So this is uh, an annual one for all of the board members who have consistently been here. This is uh, uh, part of the comprehensive plan requirement. Uh, you all pass uh, uh, the budget annually by resolution. Uh, however, the comprehensive plan requires an ordinance to be passed by state statute, uh, basically reconfirming the CIP, This is uh, which is the capital improvement plan for the, for the gas tax. Um, it is not changing. It is not altering. It is not... Um, deviating from, from the budget which you've already approved. Uh, this is simply a, sort of a bookkeeping requirement that the state statute has. 
Uh, this ordinance then normally in the past was transmitted to the state. However, in the most recent update, they've actually said um, that if you pass the ordinance, that's sufficient to, to keep that record. Uh, and if they need that uh, to look at the, the capital improvement program, uh, moving forward, they can uh, obtain those records. So this is staff's recommendation um, brought forward uh, with the uh, budget which was proposed and approved by you uh, in the same format. Thank you. Any comments? Vice Mayor Bridge. Sorry. Um, okay. I have, I, I have, um, I'm supporting the ordinance in total, and I understand um, why we have to approve it. But I want to point something out to my colleagues that would, would, would that um, it first bothered me a little bit. In the 2021 listing, there is no um, subtopic for stormwater. So in the other years, we're spending money on stormwater, but in, in the 2021 year, we, are, we do not have it listed. And when we went through the stormwater rate increase, which all of us uh, discussed, um, there was a suggestion that there would be a $100,000 annual set aside. But as it was pointed out to me, and I know that this is true, uh, that $100,000 in 2021 is not going to be spent for capital. It's going to be saved toward the future projects of stormwater. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted that just to go on record as having pointed out that in 2021, the, what we're passing here does not have a stormwater allocation. I see. Thank you. That's good. Good Thank catch. You. Appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Any other comments? Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Item 10A, discussion and possible action regarding the extension of the sculpture garden display at Optimus Park. This item is sponsored by Vice Mayor Alice Birch. Vice Mayor Birch? Thank you. Yes, um, I think we have heard in public comment that um, there's a suggestion by Fine Arts that this um, extension happened. I, I included some photos from the, uh, the, ground, the grand opening of, of the sculpture garden and I, I find it a, a really, really lovely contemplative space. And I, in uh, reading some comments of former mayor um, uh, Maurice Ferre, I came across this quote. It, and it, it was it's um, from a Herald article about the Maurice Ferre Park, uh, which was entitled Parcel B, and about which many, many uh, county commission meetings uh, discuss what the public space should be. And he said this, it's time for us to recognize in our quest for monetizing beauty that just the presence of an open green area has an irreplaceable price which has no simple calculation on a computer. And that's what Marie said, uh, Frey said. And it was actually in an article in um, the Biscayne Times, uh, not, not the Herald. And it was, um, the author of the article was Janet Goodman, who just spoke f uh, before you tonight. At any rate, I am much in favor of um, continuing to have the contemplative space and the sculpture garden extended. And I uphold my colleagues. Thank you. Councilman Meltz. Love the park. Greatly appreciate the folks who, who brought it to us before and who are continuing to lobby for it. Uh, however, I'm against two years. There's, there's no reason to do two years. I believe it should be one year because that leaves the possibilities open for what may happen in a year. Uh, just like we had the similar conversation when we approved it the first time. Everything went great. It's a wonderful asset to the village. It's greatly used and utilized and appreciated by everybody. But but it, there's no compelling reason um, to to give it a two year extension. It can everything can be accomplished by one year, and that leaves uh, possibilities for the village, for this council, or for other folks who come in with other ideas to maybe do something. So I, I've yet to hear any reason uh, why it needs to be two. Therefore, I think one would, would be 
uh, would be great and would accomplish all goals and keep everybody happy and keep everybody uh, situated in the arts. Thank you. Okay, I will. Uh, I'll make a couple comments here. Um, it's, it's. I love the use of the space. I like. You know, it looks great. Um, it's a nice compliment to having a passive park with such things. I, I would tend to agree with Councilman Meltz that um, I'm not sure that a two-year extension is actually the best use of this space. So um, I would agree that a, I would agree to a one-year extension, but two years seems a bit long because I think I'm not certain that it's the highest and best use for that space. I think um, there might be some other opportunities for things to come and. Um, I would agree to a one-year extension. Vice Mayor Birch? Yeah. Oh. Mayor? Absolutely. Go ahead. So I just wanted to say I, I, I concur with uh, Councilman Melton and yourself. I, I think it's a wonderful addition to the village. I think it, it's something if we could do one year at a time, um, I, I would support that. Thank you, Councilman Brady. Uh, Vice Mayor Birch, were you going to make a comment? Um, I just wanted to suggest that should this other idea come along, um, we are not expending any money or signing any contracts. We are simply um, agreeing to extend by two, two, two years. If something came along, I think we would be at liberty to make the change. Uh, but if something doesn't come along and we have um, the the Fine Arts Commission in their planning has the liberty of knowing that it's probably going to be two years unless a better idea comes along, that perhaps we could go and give them that um, option at this time. That, that's what our board that we have advising us has asked us for. Any other comments? Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Lafredo. I unfortunately see myself always in the minority on contested matters on this council, but I would support Vice Mayor Birch's position that two years seems like a reasonable time. It goes by fast. But I'll be, I'll accept the will of the council, whatever they do. Thank you. Vice Mayor Birch. So I'll just go ahead and move that we accept for two years and see what happens. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. Nay. Councilman Brady? I'm going to say aye. All right. Thank you. Motion passes for those. <laughs> Okay, item 10B, discussion and possible action regarding Green Day discount. This item is sponsored by the village manager. Mr. Manager. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> you have in your packet a letter that I recently received from Mr. Hornbuckle from the Chamber of Commerce asking for a discount from, uh, for the Chamber of Commerce for a Green Day that was a rousing success here this past Saturday. <laughs> Uh, as you see from the memo that I provided you, in uh, to give you the historical historical perspective, the village has been providing the chamber with a $4,500 discount for the services we provide, which includes uh, stage setup uh, by the recreation department. Uh, they also assisted in the in the actual placement of the booths and setup. Public Works, of course, did all the cleanup, put out the barricades, and the police provided security and traffic control. Um, as I indicated, this is about a $10,000 item, um, and in past years we had a two-year contract with the Chamber whereby we provided um, um, funds, if you will, to pay part of the Executive Director's salary, and in return they agreed to pay the expenses over and above $4,500. So if that's your pleasure to grant them that discount, uh, we will absorb it in our current operating budget and whatever uh, we expend over and above $4,500, we'll send the Chamber a bill for that amount. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Any comments? Okay. 
how much? I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, afraid I'm, I'm sorry to prolong this, but how much are we absorbing? 4,500. The first 4,500 we will absorb. In other words, we're giving them a credit on the bill of $4,500. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Meltz, did you have a comment? No, I, I just think this is a no-brainer. We've done this for years. It's one of our best events, and, and I hope everybody supports it. Do I have a motion in favor? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Thank you. Item 10C, discussion and possible action regarding ratification of the Federation of Public Employees Collective Bargaining Agreement, effective October 1st, 2019. This item is sponsored by the Village Manager. Mr. Manager? Yes, ma'am. The uh, Federation of Public Employees um, Collective Bargaining Agreement has expired. Uh, these, uh, this is the organization that represents our blue-collar workers, if you will, that work primarily in public works and recreation. Uh, Mr. Davis, our public works director, has negotiated with them a, a uh, what I consider to be a, a very fair deal and that the only thing they've asked for is a 3% COLA the current, in this current fiscal year and in 2021 and a wage reopener in year 2022. The, the rest of the terms and conditions of the contract will stay the same. And I believe this is a, a good deal and I recommend approval. Any comments? I'll move approval. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Thank you. Village announcements. Village offices will be closed in observance of Veterans Day on Monday, November 11th, and on Thursday, November 28th, and Friday, November 29th for the Thanksgiving holiday. Normal sanitation schedules will be followed. The next Village Council meeting will begin at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, November 19th at Village Hall Council Chambers. The Miami Shores Farmer's Market is open every Sunday at Optimus Park from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Come enjoy fresh produce from local farms and prepared foods for every taste. Come join the Miami Shores Gobble Wobble 5K Run, which will be held on November 24th at 7.30 a.m., Register online at active.com. Online registration ends Saturday, November 23rd, 2019. The Village's annual Winterfest celebration is scheduled for Friday, December 6th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Please call the Recreation Department at 305-758-8103 for additional information and details on all of the upcoming holiday events. And would you rather receive the newsletter via email? Please contact the Communications Specialist uh, by clicking on the contact, contact us link on the front page of our website. Please visit the Village website for more information on Village events departments and to sign up to receive agenda notifications. Village Council comments. Thank you. We'll sit on this end. Mr. Lafredo, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, just briefly, I first of all want to commend Councilman Meltz for his leadership on the speeding issue. As one of the council members that lives close to 103rd and it's a real issue, and I really thank him for pushing that. I think it's we're making progress, and I'm pleased to see that. The other thing is I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and Public Works and the Village and every, all the vendors and participants and civic groups because we went to Green Bay. We, Green Day, we took the grandbaby in the stroller, and it was wonderful, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Meltz. <laughs> Uh, just a, a point of correction. I think um, the farmers market is till two p.m. Or is that right? Nine to two. Nine to two. Okay. Just want to make sure because we want as many people there as possible and start the momentum on that. Um, I, I was approached for some res residents who are interested in something that I think we bantied about previously: a environmental board, a sustainability board, or something like that. I strong, strongly encourage them to gather some other folks and to bring it and I'll place it on agenda. So if anybody else is interested, and maybe was it the first uh, creation of first board in how many years, a new board? 20. 20 years, so I guess it's time. Um, well, we have the education, education advisory. advisory. Right, right, right. right. So, but, so whatever their name is, or, but you, you get the gist of what they want to do, and I think it's a great idea, so. Thank you, Vice Mayor Birch. Oh, yes, I had a wonderful time. 
Green Day. I thought it was phenomenal. I'm happy to support it. And I think that um, our staff did a great job. We had the recreation department, as, as the manager said. We had the police department, as well as public works. Everybody worked really hard. The setup was very hot and uh, dif difficult, you know, made difficult by the, by the heat. Um, so I want to thank everyone from the village angle as well as the chamber. I think they did a great job and so did their board and volunteers. And um, it was just a lot of fun. It was wonderful. I want to say a couple things about the farmer's market. First of all, the, yes, um, the hours of 9 to 2, as Councilman Meltz corrected. But the other thing is on the back of the, uh, of the announcement are the first, sun oh, don't have this on. first Sunday's Community Bazaar. First Sunday's Community Bazaar details are on the back of this flyer, which was in your chamber packet, and it, it lists that December 1, January 5, February 2, March 1, April 5, are open to you if you sign up to have your space for no charge. And this was a concept we had when we first talked about the farmer's market. We said, what if one of our, um, some of our residents grow vegetables or they wish to have a sale of collect collectibles? Now they will have a place to do it. And, but you just have to register for that with the, the person, uh, the marketcompany.org. And when you do, you'll have your own space. And that will be a really nice feature for our residents. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at the 5K run because we didn't have it last year, um, and it's going to be terrific, so it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you, Vice Mayor Birch, and, and we expect you to be at the front of the pack during that race, too. <laughs> I just want to... <laughs> not barely. I wanted to thank everybody with regard to Green Day. It was really wonderful. I know that my family and I enjoy it every year. Um, and this year, I saw a bunch of new vendors, and so I thought that was exciting, and I, I thought it was a great crowd. Um, so I just want to commend everybody that worked so hard on that, and anything we can do to keep it going, I'm always going to support um, and I'm very excited for the farmer's market to start. Exciting. So that's all I have for the evening. Uh, Mr. Brady, forgot about you over there, sir. Whoa. No, no, thank you. No, I just want to say that following um, the meeting of using the, the streaming site in the Grand Finish for the event, I just wanted to say uh, how nice it works. And um, good sound, good picture, and it's nice to see it you know, move through and indicate which uh, um, agenda item that you're currently on. So. Uh, I just wanted to, I had not experienced it this way, and uh, it actually works really well. Thank you all for uh, letting me join by phone tonight. Great. Great comment, Councilman Brady. Actually, thank you for letting us know that you could, with the quality of what you were seeing. I appreciate that. It's good feedback. Uh, Vice Mayor Birch? Oh, I just wanted to say, safe travels, Councilman Brady. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, be the, being there, no further business before the council. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.